Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Friday, April 15th, 2022. I'm delighted to be back with Professor Paul Bellin. Paul, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Paul, today I'd like to start with your work in the early 2000s. When you were working on accretion disks and jets, was that your first foray into closer to astrophysics, or had you done work on this previously? I think it was my first foray. What was going on at that point? What was some, what were some of the things happening in astrophysics where where you were contributing? Well, I I don't know. I was on the periphery. Um, I think I had a postdoc at that time, Scott Shue, and we were working <clears throat> on the jets. I guess it, it was. At that time, that we started to realize that we had jets, the experiment was intended to show how spheromax formed, and I had no idea that there were jets. That slowly became apparent. I mean, slowly, like over two years or so, that we were making jets and that they were going unstable. And I think Scott was the one who thought that uh, this might have some connection to astrophysics, and got me to start thinking about that. So um, started reading the astrophysical literature and, and realized that we were doing that. Um, we made some contact with a colleague at JPL, David Meyer, who was uh, studying astrophysical jets and who had a, I think a postdoc at the time from Japan, I don't remember his name right now, it will come, come to me, but this postdoc was doing numerical models of astrophysical jets and was seeing kink instabilities in them and, and his numerical models looked an awful lot like our experiment. I mean, to an outsider, they looked more or less the same. So that made, made me realize that this was uh, a connection. And so I started reading up on it uh, and giving talks on it and um, I also got asked to give talks on this at a conference on high energy density laboratory astrophysics. There's a group at the Livermore lab using the National Ignition Facility, their big laser, meant to do laser fusion. And as a sideline, they were claiming that they were achieving astrophysically relevant parameters in their experiments, that they were getting very high densities or temperatures or uh, whatever would be appropriate for certain astrophysical situations. So they had a, set up a meeting held every second, years, second year on that, and, and they invited me to give a talk, I think in Tucson, on, on my stuff. And I didn't really fit under high energy density. They had some and definition of what high energy density was, and I was nowhere near that. But the astrophysics laboratory part w was related, and they were interested in that. So I got into that community. And um, so I was kind of off and running with astrophysics at that point, and I just slowly learned it from then on. I found the whole thing rather amusing because when I was a graduate student at Princeton, the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, where I worked, was organizationally a offshoot of their astrophysics department. Um, it was related to Princeton University, like JPL is related to Caltech, was an off-campus. Uh -huh. So I knew a lot of people on it, but there was an organizational chart that showed the university and the astrophysics department, the university in a little box underneath the astrophysics department, saying the Plasma Physics Lab even though the plastic physics lab was probably 25 times as big as the astrophysics department. Right. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the courses I took were taught by people, sometimes from astrophysics and astrophysics students took the same courses and I, I took courses in the astrophysics building. But I never actually took any astro, real astrophysics courses. I just took plasma courses. In any case, when I got my PhD, it, it said, uh, doctorate in astrophysical sciences, because that was the <laughs> astrophysical part. 
So I have a doctorate in astrophysical sciences, but I didn't know any astrophysics. So I felt I was making good on my on, on what it said in my degree. Now, now I really do know astrophysics, or at least some astrophysics. Paul, with your work at that point on accretion disks and jets, was there opportunity for internal collaboration at Caltech? I'm thinking, for example, Roger Blanford before he left for Stanford. Yeah, we were talking to him. We, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say we were collaborating, but but we did talk to him, and he was aware of our experiments, and uh, we got some pointers from him. And then over the years, I've had some uh, modest contact with him. Um, um, I think. There was a bit of a ship's passing in the night issue in that he's much more general as he was looking on many aspects of astrophysics. And this was just one little point. So I'd get all excited about the specific thing we were seeing, but that was just like one of a thousand things that he was interested in. So um, it, it was a little bit hard to get him to focus on our particular experiment. I mean, he would be polite and, and listen, but, but he had a lot of other things on his mind also. Paul, I'm curious the extent to which it was rather late in the game for you to become involved in astrophysics. What does that tell us more generally about the broader aloofness of plasma physics from astrophysics? Well, I think things have changed in the last 20 years. Um, or, or even more than that, because I, I think a lot of this has to do with just how the world has changed and, and with the explosion of communication and information uh, I, I, more than with people. Um, so before the World Wide Web and, and desktop computers and so on, when, when you just worked with printed, things and books and, and journals in, in the mail, it was hard for you to go outside of your own field. Uh, you spend all your efforts in your, in your own field and, and that was, was that. And I suppose you, you might meet somebody in another field at a cocktail party or, or and you could make a connection that way, but generally you wouldn't be exposed to things in other areas so much. And I, I first became aware of it when I was doing some work on a kind of plasma wave called an alpine wave. And I just knew about it in my context, but the web bibliographic searches were just coming up. And I did a search in alpine waves and I discovered there were all sorts of magnetospheric applications of it, which hadn't occurred to me. And I looked into that and actually wrote <coughs> one or two papers on, on that, I taught myself enough to, to, to say things about that. So I think this um, business of jumping from one area to another, or at least looking at how what you do applies to a different area, became easier uh, once it was easier to access information. You didn't have to go to a sit in a library for four hours looking through the stacks to find the right thing. Um, so I, I think I was one of the early people to try to make this jump from laboratory plasma physics to solar and astrophysics and other people um, have done that a lot more since, which is more common now, but I, I think there's just it's just easier to communicate across fields now than it was before. And Paul, your entree through accretion disks and jets into astrophysics what about that was happenstance and what about that is logical that that would be the the entry point for a plasma physicist to start thinking about astrophysics okay. well the uh, the accretion disks was something that came later i would say the jets what we were doing in our experiment was making these jets and we had electrodes and capacitors and power you know, power supplies and coils uh that was the apparatus for making the, the jet, and then the jet would be in the plasma. And, and I spent a lot of time wondering what is the astrophysical equivalent of, of our electrodes and power supplies. And 
gas injectors, and coils, and, and so on. I'm, I'm still worrying about that, but that, but that, that's got to be the accretion disk. And I, um, there were theories of, about that um, that seemed to explain it very quickly. And I used those also, but then when I thought about them, I felt that there was something wrong with those theories. They were they were being used out of context. In fact, th this led me to a sort of favorite bugaboo. I think in a lot of areas, people will use things out of context. There'll be some theory that's a great theory in its own context, but then people will take it and, and use it someplace where the assumptions that it went into that theory don't hold. And I find this very common. So I think this was going on with um, accretion disks. And yeah, you're, I guess you're touching a nerve. Uh, there was a, a theory that was very popular and is very popular in the astrophysical world having to do with accretion disks. It's called the magnetorotational instability. And I think it came into being in the, 90s, maybe the 80s, 80s or 90s or so. But in, in astrophysics, there was a big problem having to do with angular momentum. And mm -hmm. when I first heard about this, I didn't understand it very well. And it, I, I, my first feeling was, who cares? And, 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 and second, well, I didn't understand it. Um, and then over the years, you know, the big I understood what it was, and then I realized that it's a big problem. Now it's intuitive to me, and it went from being something I didn't understand at all to being intuitive. Um, any, anyhow, uh, this problem has kicked around in astrophysics for a long time, and, and it has to do with accretion. And it is that when things accrete, they have come in with angular momentum, but as they go to smaller radius, their angular momentum would increase according to the basic loss, but it clearly doesn't, and something has to get rid of the angular momentum, and, and people couldn't figure it out. So this magnetorotational instability was proposed, and all the astrophysicists lashed onto it. There were meetings with hundreds of people in awe listening to speakers about this, and, and there's huge numbers of papers. I think there's over 1,500 papers uh, on the magnetorotational instability. And I tried to understand it. It was a very complicated derivation and I went through it and I could barely work through the simplest version of it, but it always struck me as being too contrived and I didn't really believe in it. So I set about trying to come up with alternate explanations. And I, I think I started this probably about 10 or 15 years ago. And, and so I've been hacking away <clears throat> at, 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 at some kind of alternate to the magnetic rotational instability over all those times. And it's been very interesting. It came up with ideas that, that, that I liked a lot. So th th this was a, a theory effort that was motivated by our experiments. That is, what's the equivalent of the power supply in our experiments? And I've, I've published a bunch of different papers and uh, right now student of mine and I have a paper that's in press on that. That's the latest version of that. And we, I really think we're coming up with good explanations that, that uh, are excellent alternates to the new rotational instability. Um, so uh, there was something I probably mentioned before, I think, about, did I mention canonical angular momentum before? A, a little bit, but we should go into oh, that some more. Yeah. Okay. So, I felt that this was a critical thing with accretion disks. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that comes straight out of classical mechanics of Hamiltonians and Lagrangians. And it's like one of the first things you learn, but it seems to have gotten forgotten by the astrophysicists. Um, I thought I thought they knew about it, but um, I wrote a bunch of papers on it, but when I did a Google search or, or a web, uh, uh, I guess a bibliographic search on all the times that canonical angular momentum was mentioned in astrophysics, I only found my own papers. I didn't find anybody else's. So it, it didn't seem to be there. But the, um, 
general idea is that when you have a magnetic field, ordinary angular momentum that we're familiar with is not a conserved quantity. There's something else that's more complicated. It's ordinary angular momentum plus another term that involves the magnetic field that's conserved. And then when you look at it that way, you can come up with all sorts of explanations for what's going on in an accretion disk. So I've attacked that problem from many points of view, and I think we've been making good progress on it. So that the, so I found accretion disks interesting from that point of view. And then uh, the dusty plasma stuff turns out to be related to that too, because your accretion disks um, become protoplanetary disks and they have a dust in them and the dust is charged. And so that's related to the dusty plasma stuff I've been, do been doing. So th th it's all interrelated. So the, we can't make accretion disks in the lab. Um, the, 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 I mean, the lab has electrodes and power supplies, but I think the, in astrophysics, you need something to replace the lab power, electrodes and, and, and power supplies. And I think that's what the accretion disk is doing. And the people who study accretion disks are generally different from the people who study jets. And so there isn't what, Paul, why is that? Why would there be that bifurcation? Because I think astrophysics is really mainly observational. And so there's one group of people <clears throat> who's looking at one thing and another group of people looking at another thing. And, and, they, um, and, and, and the theorists are separated from the observers. So the, and everybody's kind of narrowly focused on their own little topic so that there isn't a whole lot of integration in my opinion between seemingly desperate uh disparate topics um so i i think they know that accretion disks are related to jets i mean because they're always seen together um but i don't think they're people trying to study how an accretion disk drives a jet or if, if there are any, if there are very, very few. Paul, in the past 20 years, has there been a greater integration in the fields of plasma physics and astrophysics? I think so, yeah. For the better, the reason, this is a good development. Yeah, yeah, I think so, I think. Well, if you look at it historically, the almost started together and then they separated and now they're coming back together again a little bit. I mean, not tightly together, but, the, but the, the, there are a fair number of lab experiments that are trying to do astrophysically relative things. And I don't think that existed uh, a generation ago. Paul, what remaining work needs to be done in this field and why should astrophysicists be alert to what plasma physicists can offer? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I don't th think we understand lots of things. So um, the, I guess uh, to answer your question, I, I, I'm thinking of something that Alphane wrote, Alphane is like the, the great man of plasma physics. And, uh, <clears throat> so he, he was somewhat controversial at the time, but he said something that, uh, at least one of his books, he said something that I kind of liked. And he said that the astrophysicists tend to think of space as being filled up with objects like stars and planets, and, 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 and maybe there's some stuff in between them, but they're all individually individual things and, and, and they're little spheres that are connected together and he was saying you should really think of of space as being like electric circuits that there's stuff flowing from one place to another that's interacting with something at a distance and, and it, 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 it's a different point of view and he pointed out that before the space age before before there were the first spacecraft that's how we thought about the solar system there was the sun and there were the planets and, and well, the, the moons, and that, and that was that. And then when spacecraft went up, we discovered that 
there was the magnetosphere and the solar wind and all the stuff going on in interplanetary space, which was quite complicated. And there were all these circuits of, of, of stuff flowing from one place to another and affecting things uh, elsewhere. Um, there's a heliopause and the magnetopause and the magnetotail and all, all, all the stuff of that. But you wouldn't know about any of that if you didn't have spacecraft going up and measuring it in situ you can't really see it from a, a distance. And he suggested that there's the same kind of stuff going on in astrophysics, but since you can't send spacecraft up there, you can't um, make local measurements since you don't know about it. And then in, in plasma physics, there's this tremendous hierarchy from large scales to small scales. And, I mean, it's like the Earth we live on or the air we breathe there's wind and then there's molecules and the molecules are made of atoms and there's all this levels of stuff but the plasmas have many levels of description and we can only see the largest scales from a distance but the small scales are important and and we're, we're, we're seeing that in lab stuff in the magnetosphere so that's i don't think the astrophysicists have really caught up with the small scale stuff or the importance of the small scale stuff Paul, does this relate to cosmology at all, the large-scale structure of the universe? Uh, I don't know. Probably not so much. Uh, or, I mean, it depends on how you define things, but I, I don't think of plasmas physics as being related to cosmology particularly, although because it's a very classical field. There are people who talk about plasma concepts, in a cosmological situation. I'm thinking in the early universe, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, there are probably things going on there that are, that, that are like that. I'm just not familiar with them. And occasionally people use plasma concepts there, but the ideas are much woollier at, the, at that point. And, and right. People aren't. Uh, de dealing with the, it's r rather definitive th things that we're dealing with in, in laboratory plasmas and space plasmas now. Paul, switching topics, a nomenclature question. Helicity, helicity injection, what is that? Oh, well, I just gave a lecture on helicity, so I'm all primed. Great. <laughs> that, but, but you could probably ask me in my sleep. But it's what I thought. Uh, so th there's two or three concepts I want to mention. There, there's something called a magnetic flux tube. You have magnetic field lines and you have a bunch of them and they go around and then they join on themselves. So you could have something like an automobile tire or, or, or bicycle inner tube with magnetic field going around in a circle. And that, that, so that would be a flux tube and the ends are connecting on itself. And then you can imagine two flux tubes that are linked, like links in a chain, you have a, something like that. So the linkage of two flux tubes like that, that's velocity. And it's also equivalent to um, a twisted magnetic field. It's, it's um, mathematically the same thing. So you can actually do parlor tricks illustrating elicity. I just did it in class a couple of days ago, but I, I, don't, know, I don't have anything that's right here that's like that. But if you take this and you t if you put a twist in it and then you tape it to the end, so you've got a loop with one twist in it. I give, I'm giving you homework. Yes. To take a ribbon and, and make, a, I guess, two twists, I think is what we want to make. I can't remember what it's. Maybe one full twist, actually, one full twist. So, so, so it comes out on the same side uh, when you go around and tape it up. And then once you make that, take a scissors and cut it lengthwise, going along the length all the way along. And, and when you do that, you'll find that you get two, two things that are linked together. It, it, it seems like magic. It's like a, a magic trick. But, but it, it, th there's a way of counting up the twists and the linkages and you find that you can turn a twist into a linkage or a linkage into a twist and and the, the, either way it shows up that's helicity 
so um, <clears throat> and you, you get helicity in a magnetic situation where you have a magnetic field in a plasma and then you arrange for an electric current to flow along that magnetic field. So from Ampere's law, if you have a current, that'll not make a magnetic field, but that new magnetic field will be around the current. And so now, now you've got two magnetic fields, the original straight one, and then the one from the current that's going around the original one. So that's a linkage type situation. Um, so to inject helicity, you need to have a coil to make the original field. And then you have to have a current that flows along the magnetic field made by that coil. And, and then you're in injecting velocity. So the, the, this is what goes on in jets and spheromax and tokamax. They all have twisted magnetic fields. And to make the twisted magnetic field, you, you, you've got twisting it up is equivalent to running a current along it, which is injecting a current. Paul, your work on solar plasmas and simulating them in laboratory experiments. How do you do that? What does that look like? Well, um, we make a system that starts with something that's essentially a horseshoe magnet. So you've got a North Pole here and a South Pole here. And so you get magnetic field that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. And this is in a vacuum chamber. And we also have some holes in the magnets where we can squirt gas through. We have fast gas wells that can make some, get some puffs of gas in there. So there's a little neutral gas in there. Then we apply high voltage between the North Pole and the South Pole, like 5,000 volts difference between the North Pole and the South Pole. So that high voltage will break down the gas and we'll have plasma there. And then the magnetic field going from the North Pole to the South Pole acts somewhat like a wire. The particles can flow easily along the magnetic field, but they can't flow perpendicular to the field. So it acts like a wire that guides the current. An electric current will flow from the North Pole to the South Pole because of the high voltage. So now we've injected helicity because we've got a current flowing along the magnetic field. And the current will tend to pinch upon itself. It's a, it, it has a self force that will tend to squeeze it down. So you get a narrow loop. And so you've made a, a solar loop. And what, what is, what is the broader application of this when you simulate it? How might that be applied beyond the laboratory? Well, we're not trying to come up with an application that would be used in everyday life um, where the, the point of this is really to understand what's going on on the sun and to, 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 to simulate things that are happening on the sun. So we, we were able to see these loops expand and go unstable. Um, I argued that these loops behave like two jets pointing at each other and we're able to to show that um, we've shown that you can prevent them from expanding by adding an extra magnetic field to, to them. We've shown that they can expand in an explosive way by having them held down and then suddenly break loose. Um, so the, the, there are many aspects of, of this that we're able to um, study, but we're not trying to make a gadget that would be useful from this. Now, in thinking about what's happening on the sun, I'm curious, do you consider heliophysics to be a subset of plasma physics? No, uh, I mean, plasma physics, th there are different regions of the sun and, and the outermost region, uh, basically the surface of the sun and then going out from the surface it, it is pretty much described by plasma physics, but, but by magnetohydrodynamics. And so it's very similar to the physics in our experiment, which is, which is why uh, we can do things relevant to the, to the solar situation. But I don't think this would be, what I do is not, excuse me, what I do is, not relevant to the interior of the sun, where things are more of a 
I wouldn't say solid, but but they're not really plasma. Like, although just observationally, we can't possibly know what's going on interior to in the sun. Well, well, actually, people do know a lot about the sun. It's not my field, but they have um, things that are equivalent to seismographs, things that measure earthquakes, and they can measure sun quakes, and they can do it with spectacular resolution so they and, and they can do tomography on that so they can actually see inside the sun um, they can even see what's going on on the other side of the sun they can look right through the sun with, with this it's fairly spectacular it's not my field but, but th 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 there's a fair amount of knowledge of what's going on inside the sun paul i'll ask you to translate a paper title a model for the condensation of dusty plasma what what does that mean what is a dusty plasma Okay, um, <clears throat> so normal plasma has electrons and ions in it, and the electrons are, of course, much lighter than ions, and in many plasmas, <clears throat> the electrons are hotter than the ions, although in some plasmas they're the same temperature, but there's a whole class of plasmas which are weakly ionized, but there's a lot of neutrals. <clears throat> and not much plasma and in those plasmas the neutrals are cold the ions are in thermal equilibrium but the neutrals and the electrons are hot and that so the electrons being hotter and lighter go faster than the ions if you stick a material object like a speck of dust in a plasma like that it will be impacted by the neutrals the ions and the electrons and if it's hit by the neutrals, nothing much happens. It's just like a speck of dust in the air we're breathing. Uh, if it's hit by an ion, the ion could stick and, and, and leave a positive charge. And if it's hit by an electron, the electron could stick and it would have a negative charge. But because the electrons are going much faster, the flux of electrons onto the little speck of dust is much more than the flux of ions. So the dust grain will tend to become negatively charged. And as it becomes more negatively charged, it'll start repelling electrons because it's negative and they're negative. Things of the same sign will repel each other. And maybe ions will come in a little bit easier because ions are attracted to that. So this will go on until it gets to an equilibrium where there's equal numbers of electrons and ions hitting it but it'll remain negative because the, the original <clears throat> electron flux was much bigger. So now you've got this dust grain, which is negative sitting in a plasma. But if you think of what a plasma is, it's a connection, a collection of negative particles and positive particles and charged particles. So the dust grain is a charged particle. It's just very big and heavy, but it's a charged particle. So your plasma, is now a collection of two types of negative particles, electrons, and these dust grains, which are negative, and they could have different amounts of charge on them, depending on how big they are and what the plasma uh, is doing. But um, so now, if you have a lot of dust grains, <clears throat> you could have a situation where the dust grains start repelling each other because they're all negative. And if you have lots and lots of dust, dust grains, so they're close together, then let's say you have th three dust grains, one here, one in the middle, and one, one on this side. The one in the middle tries to go to the left and get repelled. If it goes to the right, it'll get repelled. So it'll try to stay in the middle. And if you have lots of dust grains, every dust grain will try to stay in the middle <clears throat> relative to the other dust grains. And you'll wind up with a, a lattice situation, uh, a crystal. So that would be considered a co the dust grains condensing into a crystal lattice. So that, this was first observed in the 1990s um, by uh, people in Germany, and it's commonly seen in dusty plasmas. So you, you get something like solid state physics all over again, but with these dust grains forming a crystal structure. The neat thing about it is that it's 
almost on a human scale, the the dust grains can have varying sizes, a few microns to uh, even bigger than that, and the spacing between them could be hundreds of microns. So you can see this with ordinary cameras. You don't have to buy terribly fancy equipment, just a Nikon camera like you buy in a camera store with the appropriate lens can see these lattices. Um, and, and so the paper I think you're referring to what was trying to calculate the circumstances under which this lattice would form because you don't always get a lattice. You have to have a, enough dust grains crowded together so that they're repelling each other uh, to form this lattice. Paul, when you're looking at plasma flow that's both dynamic and stagnating, is that the same plasma okay. flow? In other words, is it the same plasma that's that's either moving, it's kinetic or it's not? Or is it two categories, two separate categories of plasma? Okay, well, I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'll try to answer what I think you're getting at. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, plasma is a bunch of particles. And so you can characterize the particles different ways. You could talk about the average velocity of all the particles. So let's say you've got a trillion particles and they're going all different directions. But if you average their velocity, you find that the average velocity is 100 meters per second. I mean, we do that with the air we're breathing. You, when you talk about the wind speed, that's the average speed of all the molecules in the air. But if you look at an individual molecule, it's not going at the average speed, it's going in some random velocity that's probably much bigger than the average speed. Um, and, and, and so the average of the square of the random velocity is what we call the temperature, or at least it's re re related to that. So a plasma could have its average velocity moving. And so that would be a dynamic motion of the plasma, or it could not have its average velocity moving. So it would be a, a static plasma. And I, I think when you talk about stagnation, that's a term where you've got a, a, a flow of, let's say a water hose pointing at a wall. And when it hits the wall, it can't have a flow because the wall is standing still. So the velocity has to go to zero. That's a, the technical term is that the flow is stagnated at that point. It's gone to zero and then the the flow will usually go out sideways at that point, but interesting things will happen. Or if you have two hoses pointed at each other, th then right at the middle, the, they can't be going to the left or the right because they're equal. And that would be a stagnation point, And that would be an interesting thing where, where things often are a little bit different. Paul, when, when you started to work on, on spheromac formation, was mm -hmm. that a basic science kind of approach, or were you thinking specifically about getting closer to nuclear fusion? Well, I think I started on it from a fusion point of view um, a little bit. I think I, I started on it really because I thought it was kind of neat physics, I, I, and it, it had a potential for fusion, but it was probably more attracted by the, the, the neat physics aspect. And, I had this idea that people should work on what they're good at. Oh, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a moment. Let me... People should work at, at, at what they're good at. Um, and um, and what they're interested in, and if everybody does that, then there'll be the most useful output. And, and I don't think it's a good idea for somebody to work on something just because they think it's important. They're, 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 I think they're better off working on what they're good at, and then more will get done, or what they're interested in. And then where do flux tubes enter the picture when you're working on spheromac formation? Oh, well, spheromax are kind of flux tubes uh, already. Uh, a flux tube is like a hose 
carrying magnetic fields. Um, and if you bend it on itself, then you've got a torus. And so that would be a, a twisted uh, and Fermax have helicity. So you have a um, twisted uh, flex tube bent on itself. A everyday example of that would be like a smoke ring. If somebody blows a smoke ring, the, 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 the magnetic field in a spheromac is very much like the magnetic field in a smoke ring. So that's a toroidal structure. A smoke ring doesn't have a twist in it, but if you added a twist to it, then, then it would be similar. How did you get involved in night shining clouds? What was what was the point of, of, of entree there? Oh, well, that's a dusty plasma problem. That um, those clouds they're called noctilucent clouds, mm -hmm. and I guess when you start studying dusty plasmas, then people mention them a lot. That it's a natural example of a dusty plasma. So I did some reading on that. So the, the, I wrote a paper, which I don't completely believe in right now. I think there's some aspects I still believe in, but I don't think it's entirely correct. Uh, that addressed an issue in noctilucent clouds. Um, I'm trying to remember it now. This is quite a while ago. Um, people were bouncing radars off of noctilucent clouds. So not, not, noctilucent clouds are kind of curious things. They exist in polar regions, like very far north or very far south on the Earth. So if you're in Sweden, you can see them. And they exist in summertime, mainly, but and at very high and very precise altitudes, uh, like between 82 and 85 kilometers altitude, or like only a couple of kilometers in extent. Um, and they're always at about the same height. They, they don't change much. So it's like somebody painted something at a certain height and it's, it's just there. And it's very cold at those altitudes. It's about 150 Kelvin. So it's more like an astrophysics type temperature than, than the temperatures we're used to. And of course, the pressure is very low there. It's uh, more like a lab experiment. It's about 100,000 times lower than the pressure at sea level. So, so it's not, not a, or it's at the edge of space, basically. If you're a little higher than you say you're in orbit, and if you're a little lower than you say you're in the atmosphere, it's kind of at, at the, where the atmosphere turns into space. So these, these clouds um, can be seen with the naked eye if you're in, in polar regions. And they're, they come and go. They're not ordinary clouds. They're little ice grains, and, and they're charged much, just like I described, charged ice grains. Um, and um, so there's a whole group of people who have been studying this for, for many years. and. The, there are radars on the ground that will try to reflect off of them. And in principle, our radar shouldn't reflect off of them at all because they're tiny uh, bits of dust that are a few nanometers in size and the radar wavelengths are meters and a meter radar shouldn't be at all sensitive to that. But they do see fairly substantial reflection. And so I was trying to come up with a scheme for that, and yeah, the scheme's coming back to me now. So there's another thing around there that's also kind of strange. There's something called the sodium layer. Have you heard of that at all? No. Have you heard of, um, I forget what it's called now. There, there, there's, uh, with telescopes <clears throat> looking at the stars, there's a problem that the Earth's atmosphere moves around and, and, and you get blurring and twinkling and so on, you can't see very well. That's why people want to put telescopes in, in space. But people came up with the idea that you could make a, do a trick that would allow you to cancel out the effect of the Earth's atmosphere and, and basically see just as well as you could in space, or at least almost as well. And th th this trick, it's called adaptive optics. It's now being used in all modern 
telescopes. So and there are various versions of it, but one version goes like this. It's also around 85 kilometers high, there's a thin layer of sodium atoms that seems to be coming from continuous flux of meteoroids, micrometeoroids coming from outer space that ablate and they dump the, the sodium melts of that layer and, and, and you wind up with this layer of sodium. And then you can shine a laser from Earth up in the sky and, and tune it to resonate with sodium atoms. And so it'll go up to 85 kilometers and, and cause the sodium to fluoresce. And you, you focus the laser so that you get a dot in the sky and you've made an artificial star effectively. And then then the artificial star will twinkle and, and move around. You measure that and you can figure out what the atmosphere is doing. And then if you're clever, you can arrange your telescope to undo that and, and you get back a sharp picture. So th this works pretty well. Um, the solar, there's a solar telescope that has been doing this big time at, at, at Big Bear and they're able to see things down with the resolution of about a 60 miles or so on the sun now, which is fairly impressive. Um, anyways, it turns out that the sodium layer interacts with the noctilucent cloud layer and the noctilucent clouds uh, eat up the sodium. Um, there's a depletion of the sodium when there's noctilucent clouds. And I learned from my reading that um, when sodium is deposited on ice at these cold temperatures, it doesn't start burning, which is what would happen in a lab. If you put sodium in water, it bursts into flame. But at these cold temperatures, it doesn't do that. And it actually forms a metallic coating on the ice. So I had this idea that the ice grains get coated with metal. And that's why they reflect the radar so well. But then there, there was some other problem with it that made me think maybe that's not what's going on. Um, so anyway, so I, I went to a meeting on noctilucent clouds in Stockholm and I looked saw the noctilucent clouds, they met people in that community and, and, and became aware of, 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 of that issue. The, there was a curious thing about noctilucent clouds. There, at least one guy has proposed something which I think is pretty bizarre. It's a natural phenomenon, it's a cloud. And he wrote a paper claiming that these things didn't exist before 1885. It's like saying tornadoes didn't exist before a certain time, it seems like. So, so on, on what could, basis can you make that claim? He claimed that noctilucent clouds got instigated by the Krakatoa volcano explosion in that year. And, and that we're still seeing sort of the remnants of that. And before that, there wasn't anything. And his argument was that there's no historical records of noctilucent clouds before Krakatoa, because something you can see with the naked eye. And, and if you take something like the Aurora, you know, there are Chinese manuscripts from 2000 years ago talking about seeing the Aurora and, and so on. But, but he, he looked through all the ancient manuscripts and, and, and nobody had any mention of, of these things. And so he uh, had other arguments claiming. So he, he made a reasonably decent case for that. And it's conceivable that he's right. Paul, more broadly, are these clouds so specialized that they don't really tell us anything else about cloud formation or other clouds, or can you make those extrapolations? No, you can't. They're really quite different from ordinary clouds. Is there a concern with global warming that we might lose them? No, but there's a concern. They've been changing over the years, and there's a concern that that means something or other, but I'm not sure that people, have, that there's a consensus on what it means, because there are people who spend their lives measuring these things, and they have they have seen some trends and I guess at some point somebody called them the canary in the coal mine that was warning us about some terrible thing that's going to happen, but I forget what it was. <laughs> Paul, more broadly, I wonder if you can explain your interest in Hamiltonian dynamics as it relates to plasma physics. Oh, okay. Well, that's Hamiltonian dynamics is kind of the first thing you learn in physics. I mean, it, there's, it's just a glorified... Newton's law, another way of expressing 
F equals M A, but in in the, in the fancier way ways. So it's, it's it's what everybody thinks of when you think of physics. You know how things move and accelerate and have orbits and trajectories and, and so on. But the the beauty of Hamiltonian mechanics is that it exploits symmetries. Um, uh, so when you talk about angular momentum, uh, uh, you know you. You've heard of conservation of angular momentum. Sure. But if I asked you to explain why angular momentum was conserved, you probably couldn't. And <laughs> and I, that used to bother me because when, when my teachers would tell me, oh, you know, they'd explain something because of ang conservation of angular momentum, that never struck me as a particularly good explanation because I didn't see why angular momentum should be conserved. And, and the answer is you can't really see why it should be conserved. It, 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 so it comes out of the mathematics of, of Hamiltonians, and it's it's related to Newton's ideas that something will keep on, on going on its way unless there's something opposing it. Um, but the Hamiltonian says that in a stronger way. It says that if a coordinate is ignorable, which means that you move in the direction of that coordinate and, not, and nothing changes, um, then the momentum associated with that coordinate is uh, conserved. So if something is symmetric about an angle, then it's tell, it, the Hamiltonian tells you that the momentum associated with the angle, namely the angle momentum, is conserved. So I, I don't think you can really see it intuitively it just comes out of the mathematics and it's just the, the, the way the, the world is but but i mean you can't these things all these equations like schrodinger's equation and newton's equations are kind of postulates that explain how the world works but they can't be proven you can't start from something simpler and say um the, the, there's this simpler thing that we agree upon that, that then shows that Newton's equations are correct. It's just something that seems to work. Paul, tell me about the experiment where you used high-speed cameras to look at plasma jets, and you saw that they were, if I understand correctly, torn apart. Oh, well, I think we've discussed that already a, a, a bit, but we have this camera that I bought, I guess, 18 years ago now that... <clears throat> was about the fastest thing you could get at the time, and it still is. There really haven't been any enormous improvements in that. In is that it commercially area. available? Is it specific yeah. for science? Well, it's commercially available. It's not specific for science. I think it was intended more for studying artillery shells and so on. If you look at the websites to advertising, it still show you a, an artillery shell being, being followed or explosions. Uh, I, I think these cameras have their antecedents, a uh, different kind of camera that was used to study atom bomb explosions mm -hmm. in, in 1945. You know, the, the idea was to have a camera that could follow things that took place in a microsecond. So you needed a shutter speed that was faster than a microsecond. And the original cameras did this mechanically. They, they were pushing the limits of what you could do mechanically. They had a mirror like imagine my cell phone and it's a mirror and i rotate it around then an image will move real fast if i have a piece of film far away i can have the image move in the film real fast so if i rotate the mirror as fast as i can i can just barely make something that could uh, capture things at a million frames per second but then in the digital aid people figure out how to get rid of all the mechanical stuff and make digital cameras and digital cameras actually can't work that fast, but they use uh, image intensifiers. That's like what people use for night vision goggles. And they have an electrical switch on them to turn the, the night vision goggle on or off. So that's electrical and you can do that real fast. So if you put that in front of your digital camera, then you can get a uh, very fast shutter speed. And then if you want to make a movie camera, well, there's a brute force way of making a movie camera if you don't care about the money. 
And that is you buy a separate camera for each frame of your movie. <laughs> so that costs lots of money, but then you've got a movie camera. So you do that and then you fire the camera sequentially and, and now you've got that. So this camera I have works like that, except clearly you can't afford to buy too many cameras. So it has a limited number of frames. It, it basically has eight frames, but then it has a trick where it's able to get 16 frames. So, and, and, and then it can operate real fast. Its shutter speed is five nanoseconds, five billionths of a second. Um, so it, it can, in principle, take movies at the rate of 200 million frames per second, which is actually faster than what we need. And did you use this to, to look at solar flares? We use it for both our solar experiment and for our jet experiment. They're, they're similar. And the thing is, our experiments take place on a time scale of, or at least the duration for the solar experiment is about five or seven microseconds. And the jet experiment in one mode is also about five or seven microseconds. In another mode, it's about 40 microseconds. And then things happen during that time. So you want to be able to look from one microsecond to the next, or even a fraction of a microsecond, maybe a tenth of a microsecond to the next. So having a camera this fast is very good because we can uh, study things that, that, that are going on that fast with it. What were you learning about solar flares? What was interesting to, to, about this project? Well, we've seen a bunch of things. We've seen how they expand. Um, my students came up with something a, a few years ago that was pretty neat. I, I had argued that there are jets coming from <clears throat> what are called the foot points. Remember, I described the North and the South Pole. So th there's a, a jet coming from the North Pole, a jet coming from the South Pole, and there's plasma flowing up, and that's what fills. You, you were asking about flux tubes. The magnetic field going from the North Pole to the South Pole, that's the flux tube. At least the, the, the think of a tube <clears throat> of field lines, a bundle of field lines going from the North Pole to the South Pole, that would be the flux tube. And if there's flows of plasma up, then this, these magnetic field lines get filled up with plasma. But, and there are magnetic forces that cause this whole thing to expand. <clears throat> so that the, the, the sort of arch rises up so what my students saw was uh, we seen years ago that the top of this thing often would have a dip in it and we would assumed that that was a projection of a helix or a kink on it but it didn't really make sense because it always looked the same if it was a projection of something it should be random it should sometimes be one way and sometimes another way but it was always the same way and then they realized that it wasn't a projection of something. Instead, there are these jets coming up and <clears throat> they would collide at the top and the, the top would have a higher density than the, the rest because, because they were smashing into each other and building up there. And since there were forces accelerating things up, at the top, it would be heavier because there was more mass there because of this collision. So if you have the same force and more mass, the acceleration is less because acceleration is the force over the mass. So the top would not keep up with the rest. And so when you looked at this thing expanding, the top would be dragging behind. And so it would look like a dip. Um, and um, so we saw that with our cameras. And uh, we also played games with multiple colors. Um, we would to show that there were jets. We'd use one gas coming from the North Pole and one gas coming from the South Pole, say nitrogen on one and hydrogen on the other, take pictures, put filters in a camera and color code things so we could distinguish one gas from another and we could see a red plasma hitting a green plasma. So th th that uh, was something we uh, were able to establish. Paul, I'm curious if you have any opinions on the idea that solar flares affect climate on Earth. Specifically, there are some people who think that part of the warming Earth issue is increased solar flare activity. Well, 
It's possible. It would be a very indirect route because the, the solar f activity does affect the Earth's magnetosphere and the ionosphere, as we're talking about 100 miles up. But the problem is that the densities of things up there are maybe 100,000 or a million times less than they are on Earth. So I guess if you're talking about, say, hurting a person, it's like you pull one hair on a person and saying that's going to affect their lifespan. So it seems a little bit unlikely. Um, there just isn't much uh, there. But it may have some effects in that it could affect clouds at high altitudes. For example, like the noctilucent clouds are at an altitude where solar activity conceivably could affect them, or um, it could affect the Earth's magnetic field, which could indirectly affect polar regions and aurora. There's some tiny things that might happen, but um, it's not obvious that there would be some major d d direct hit. There are there are some things, though, that are major direct hits. Uh, the solar physicists like to make a big fuss about this. Um, you could, well, I'll give the historical example of this. There were two historical examples. But the most recent one was in, in 1989, there was a solar storm that knocked out the electric power in the province of Quebec in Canada for about a day and caused many tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. And so the issue is the Earth's magnetosphere has electrons going around a circle. This is somewhat related to the Van Allen radiation belt, but th these electrons are doing lots of things. And one of the things they're doing is moving in a circle around the Earth. It's not like an orbit, it's, um, because they're making different kinds of orbits, but they're, they're stuck up there and they're sort of drifting around in a circle. And this circular motion of the electrons constitutes an electric current. That's called the ring current. And, and although each electron is tiny and so on, there's lots of them. And the amount of current in the ring current is a big current. I forget what the number is, but it's a lot. Um, so when there's a solar storm, it can hit the Earth's magnetosphere and interfere with that ring current and interrupt it. So if you know about electric transformers, a transformer has a primary and a secondary. And so the ring interrupting the ring current is like changing the current in, a, in the primary of an electric transformer. And if you do that, that will make a voltage on the secondary or change the current in the secondary, but the secondary will feel something. Um, so the ring current, changing the ring current was like changing the primary in a transformer and that induced currents on the earth and things that could conduct it. And the things that could conduct it uh, were electric power grids. So it, it sent spurious currents along long distance electric power grids. And it turned out the current isn't that much, but the current was if effective it was a very low frequency current and so that was effectively like a dc current and that got added to the normal current of the transformers and the power grid and they don't like to have a dc current on them they're meant for ac and if you have a dc on it that will affect the transformers in the system it'll wreck them it's sort of like having a seesaw that's delicately balanced to go back and forth and then you put a big weight on one end and then doesn't work properly so it burned out the transformers, they blew up and uh, a whole string of transformers blew up. So the, the, this could happen again. It would be um, if, if you had a big solar flare, um, it could knock out electric power grids. So electric companies are aware of this. And at the dawn of solar physics, there was, a, I guess, 1859, there was a famous incident this, uh, this is sort of the, the book of Genesis for solar physicists. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a British scientist named Lord Carrington who built 
the first sort of serious device for looking at the sun. He had some kind of lens or mirror or something other that would make an image of the sun on a table. And when he just got it working, there was a solar flare and he had a, an assistant with him. So they both saw it and it was a big solar flare. In fact, it's the biggest solar flare that anybody has seen since 1859, which is quite amazing because he just set this up and he sees the big one. So that's called the Carrington flare. And the earth, at least the world wasn't industrialized the way it is now, but they did have some things. They had telegraph wires all over the place. And this thing, this Carrington flare was enough to cause the wires and the telegraphs to have high voltage on them to spark and to cause fires. So there were fires around the world because of the Carrington flare. So anyways, th th people could, in retrospect, figure out how big the, the Carrington flare was. And it was much bigger than the Quebec one. And if it happened now, it would do billions of dollars of damage to our economy, it would knock out things all over the place. Um, so solar physicists are kind of writing off of that. And we, we, we have no effective defenses as of yet? Well, we, well, we have some defenses. Um, one defense we have is that you have some warning of it because when it comes from the sun, it doesn't come instantly. It takes about 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours to make its way from the sun because it, 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 it's not the radiation. It's actually a plasma, somewhat like my experiment. Sphere max that is ejected from the sun and traveling towards the earth and it takes a day or two to hit the earth and then it knocks the daylights out of the earth's magnetosphere and can uh, cause all this um, so you so you can have warning and then if you know it's coming you can tell people to bat down the hatches disconnect this and shield that and and, and so on um, the, a flare like that might uh, be very harmful to astronauts in space too, because there'd be a lot of x-rays associated with it. Those would come more or less instantly, so you wouldn't be able to uh, protect yourself against that. You, you wouldn't know it was coming. Paul, tell me about your work with solar loops and what its impact was for space weather science. Well, I'm not sure whether we've had an impact yet, we've been working with the solar physicists over time and, and understanding how these loops go unstable. And, and um, we're, I think we've had some impact, I guess. We've done some experiments where we had two of these loops interacting with each other and uh, the people in the sun have sometimes seen that and the, at least one or two have referred to our, our work. So I, I, I think um, we've had some m moderate impact in, in, in how think, people think about things. Uh, and more generally in space weather science, are they primarily plasma physicists? Yeah, space weather is essentially plasma physics. And how far back does that field go, space weather? Um, I think it goes back to the Second World War, maybe earlier. It's kind of the beginnings of plasma physics because it had to do with um, shortwave radio propagation. Did you ever listen to shortwave radio or you know what shortwave radio? I know what it is, yeah. Okay, so ham radio operators and, and, and International broadcasters would use shortwave radio, so you could listen to Radio Moscow or the BBC or, or whatever, or Radio Australia, sitting in Pasadena, and you have a radio that would listen to those things. And the question is, how did that work? It worked by radio waves coming from a transmitter and reflecting off the Earth's ionosphere. It would be like a mirror. It would bounce back and forth between the ionosphere, which is maybe 100 or a few hundred miles up, and the ground. And, and, and you get what's called a skip. So it might take two or three skips to make its way um, there. So when this happened, um, people were surprised. There was a book about Marconi that, that I read a while ago called Thunderstruck, excellent book uh, that described this. When, when people, when Marconi got radio going, everybody thought it would be line of sight and they were very surprised that you could do this long distance. 
stuff, and it was because of the bouncing off of the plasma in the ionosphere. So that uh, kind of instigated one form of plasma physics to understand the ionosphere, which is a plasma. And then the solar storms can upset the, the uh, ionosphere. So shortwave radio is notoriously flaky. Um, sometimes it's like the weather. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, you know, there can be a good day when you can hear BBC perfectly like it's coming from next door. And then another day you can't hear anything at all, or you can hear it and it's fading in and fading out and so on. So this had military implications because if you're trying to communicate with your army that's hundreds of miles away and, or your airplanes or whatever, and it's fading in and out, this is a big deal. And it's still a big deal. Um, <clears throat> So the military uh, got interested in this and, and funded people to study this. And so, so since the sun is making this, the storms that, that affect this, you have to study solar physics. And um, sort of the, the, the radio weather will be affected by the sunspot cycle. When there's more sunspots, there's more of these solar storms and, and, and their radio is affected more and so on. So it, I th think there was a professor at Caltech, Hal Zirin, who was a solar physicist, and he sort of was aware of this history. And he ex explained to me that how the Americans and British and Germans were all studying the sun during the war because they were trying to understand how the radio communications would be. It was like meteorology, basically. If you, and even recently, I remember hearing that when the US was in Afghanistan, you know, 15 years ago, and there was a helicopter landing at some ridge, and people were trying to communicate with the helicopter. There was some kind of solar activity that interrupted the communications and caused some trouble there. So, oh, wow. And now um, it affects spacecraft because spacecraft are in orbit and, and they feel a little bit of friction from whatever plasma is up there. And if it, the plasma gets disturbed, then the friction changes and their orbit changes. And, and so they jump to a different orbit and you can actually lose a spacecraft there. You don't know where it is and you have to spend some time for that. Or th these things can destroy a spacecraft. People don't like to talk about it because if it's a military one, they don't like to talk about it. And it's a civilian one, they don't want to say, oops, we lost our spacecraft. Right. But, uh, but there have been uh, numerous examples of spacecraft destroyed by these things. Paul, I want to ask about how the Caltech plasma jet experiment got started. But first, MHD simulation. What is that? What is MHD? Oh, MHD stands for magnetohydrodynamics. Uh huh. And ordinary high, you, there's two ways of looking at it, or at least two ways of coming at it. So, one way of coming at it is from ordinary hydrodynamics where you talk about things like fluid flow and pressure. And, and if you have a pressure gradient, that'll make a flow. You, you know, your water hose, you have high pressure at one end of it, makes the water flow. The, the, down there are meteorology, you know, the, the winds have high pressure area and low pressure area, the air goes from high pressure to low pressure. And you study all that, that's uh, hydrodynamics. Um, and then if you have a plasma, then there's the additional feature that there's can be electric currents flowing because the plasma is conducting. And the electric currents will make magnetic fields. And I have electric currents and magnetic fields. And when you have electric currents and magnetic fields, you get forces, the, the product of the currents and the magnetic field in a vector sense gives you a force. So if you add that, uh, now you've got both the pressure pushing things around and the magnetic force pushing things around. Uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, if you have an electromagnet and a magnet, they'll attract each other. So that's a ma ma magnetic force. So that can act on the, the fluid. And then the plasma has the interesting feature, which I think I mentioned before, that it behaves like a superconductor so that the magnetic field is actually frozen into the plasma. If the plasma moves, the magnetic field lines move with it. And, and, and so you have this sort of puzzle where you've got currents and magnetic fields and plasma. The magnetic field 
can push the plasma around, but the plasma carries the magnetic field with it as it's pushed around. And the equations that describe that are, are magnetohydrodynamics. And the and so, experiment uh, itself, how did that get started? I'm not sure what you mean by how did it get started. What was the funding? What were the science questions that, 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 that motivated you to start the experiment? The solar experiment? Well, I guess, I think I mentioned this before, maybe not, I don't know. But I, I, I've been working on Spheromax, and which involved magnetohydrodynamics and the magnetic velocity and all, all these things we've been talking about. And I had heard, I'd been at a conference in Italy where a guy spoke about building a, a device that would simulate a solar corona loop. It hadn't occurred to me, really, that it was similar to the, the Spheromax, but it was kind of like a half a Spheromac. Uh, if, if you take a circle and you cut it in two, I, don't know if I got some thing that's a circle, but if you cut it in two, not to where you cut a bagel, but the sort of perpendicular to that, mm -hmm. and you get an arch, and, and a solar loop is effectively like a half a Spheromac, that, that, that way. So this guy was proposing to use not spheromac technology, but something closely related. I think we discussed reverse field pinch technology to, to make a loop. And it was going to be a very expensive experiment. Then um, I had come up with a scheme for making spheromax cheaply. And I thought maybe I could make a solar loop cheaply that way. So, so I, I did it as a bootleg experiment. And it sort of worked. And the, I was getting funding from Department of Energy then, and the guy who was funding me was a really nice guy. He used to be kind of hard on me, but he was nice. Um, and we saw this. He's, I, I had a camera that was a high-speed camera, but it didn't work very well. It wasn't a movie camera. It was just a still camera. And it, took, it took rather terrible pictures. They were, they were like old newspaper pictures where you could hardly see anything. Everything was black or white. And there was no gray. It was like black or white and nothing else. Um, so I complained that I couldn't take decent pictures of this, but it looked like I was seeing some kind of loop. And he said, well, what do you really want? And I said, well, I love this you know, super expensive camera over there. And he said, write me a proposal for that. And I did that and he gave me the money and I bought this very expensive camera. Um, and, and then we started taking pictures that really looked really good and um, the, the whole thing seemed worthwhile and we kind of took off from there. What were some of the findings? Well, we saw we could make the loops and that they would expand and that we could, uh, we could inhibit their expansion and uh, basically all the stuff that we've done uh, recently. Um, take multicolor pictures, um, most recently, we're seeing various instabilities and x-rays coming out of these things. Um, Paul, your work with water ice grains in laboratory plasma, was that related at all to your previous work in the clouds? Yes. In what way? Well, it, it's almost the same thing. The, the ice grains in the clouds are um, little grains of ice that are electrically charged. In, in, in a background that's cold, cold neutral gas, and the experiment is basically that. It, it, um, the ice grains in the experiment seem to be a lot larger than the ones in, in the noctilucent clouds, and not quite sure why that is, but it actually makes it easier to, to study them, but it, it, it's certainly a related thing. Another nomenclature term, Rayleigh-Taylor instability. What is that? Well, that's something you actually would know. Uh, you just didn't describe it by that term. <laughs> but um, if you, say, take a glass and you put water in it and you put oil in it so the, the water say, heavier than the oil and you somehow arrange it so the water's on top of the oil, so you have a heavy thing on top of a light thing, then you know that's unstable. I mean, you learned that when you were two years old. Sure. <laughs> um, 
but they can't just trade places because there's no room for them to trade places. However, what happens is an instability develops where ripples develop at the interface between the two of them and they trade places. So uh, I'm sure you've seen things like that. They're gift items you can buy where they have two types of fluid, one red and one blue, and, and you put one on top of the other and, and then they form ripples and trade places. That's it's, it's a heavy fluid trying to trade places with a light fluid, but and doing it by ripples. I think when you pour wine from a wine bottle and it gurgles, that, that's a really Taylor instability. Uh, because it, the wine can't just come out of the bottle. It has to, um, you, you can't have the wine trade places with the air all in one shot. It doesn't work that way. So it makes little ripples and it trades places that way. Paul, your work in 2016 and I think maybe early 2017, where you were looking at determining the wavelength of energy flowing through plasma in space that was subsequently applied in a NASA mission. T tell me about the determination. What had you discovered? Oh, okay. Well, that that was something that actually was kind of successful. Um, I mean, not that the other things weren't successful, but but this this was a had a strange history. Um, I had written a paper about something else, and I put in a little thing at the end <clears throat> on that about some sort of corollary that. that we might use this for something else and I hadn't thought about much about it and then somebody at Goddard picked up on it and, and contacted me and wanted to actually use this and I think I tried to get it to work and it didn't quite work and then I discovered that there was a rather minor mistake in a um, which I corrected and then it seemed to work. And I did a computer calculation where I simulated the kind of data that a spacecraft would, would measure. And I showed this thing would work with that. And then I gave that technique to the Goddard people and they used it and it, it worked uh, very well. Um, so the issue is this, suppose I, Suppose you've got a wave and, and a, 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 I mean, it could be a sound wave or a, a radio wave or a light wave or there are plasma waves that are different from all of those, but, but waves have certain things that make it a wave. There's a wavelength and, and there'll be a frequency and there'll be a direction. Okay. And the, we usually don't work with the wavelength. We work with the inverse of the wavelength, which is called K. Uh, and uh, that's a vector. And, and K has a direction. So it could be in the X direction or the Y direction or the Z direction. It's a, it's a vector, but and it's related to the, to, to the wavelength. So the question is, how do you measure K, which is like, how do you measure the wavelength of something? So the way you measure length of things is you get a ruler. And, and if I ask you to me measure the length of your shoe, you put your shoe beside the ruler and you'd look at one end of the shoe and you'd see zero on the ruler. And you look at the other end of the shoe and you'd see 11 on the ruler and you'd say your shoe is 11 inches long. So you have to make a measurement at two places. And the question is, if I gave you a shoe and I told you to measure the length of the shoe with the measurement at only one place, could you do that? And, and so it, could you do that with a wave? Could you measure the, the wavelength of a wave with just one a single point measurement? And this scheme I came up with allowed you to do that. Um, so it has to do with Ampere's law and a, limiting form of Ampere's law that is actually appropriate for a great many waves that people are interested in. Um, basically waves where, which are different from light waves. Like the big thing that Maxwell did was to introduce something called displacement current. And that's what allows you to have radio waves and light waves. But if you go back before 
Maxwell, there was Ampere, who didn't know about displacement currents and you didn't have this term. And, and the, the, the equation mathematically was curl of B is equal to J, where it was with Maxwell, it was curl B equals J plus displacement current. So for lots of waves, it turns out the original um, pre-Maxwell form is okay. You don't need displacement current. And so that form of at Maxwell's, uh, um, Ampere's law, it, it's a vector equation, but mathematically, I, I'll simplify it. It's, it's something like K times B is equal to J. This is oversimplified, but it just gives the idea. So if you could measure J and you could measure B, then you could figure out what K is. That, 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 that's the general idea. And so B is the magnetic field and J is the current density. And I didn't think spacecraft were capable of measuring current density because that means you've got to measure all the electrons coming and all the ions coming and take the difference between the two and then do this in the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction and do it fast. So you're doing it for a high frequency wave. And that seemed like a tall order, but apparently my, my friends of God are told me they could do that. They, they could measure J that way. B is easy to measure, that's it, it, no problem. So they, they did that and, and they could calculate a K that way using my, my, my method. As I said, it's a little bit more complicated than what I said, but the, the, I, I gave you the general idea. And then they also had the equivalent of the ruler. So, so that's something you do at a single point. You measure B and J at a single point, and from that you can get K, and that's like getting the wavelength of the wave. But they also had four spacecraft, so that's like having the ruler, so they could check it by measuring it the conventional way, by effectively putting a ruler in and measuring it, and they found that it gave the same result. So uh, it worked, and of course it's easier to use one and cheaper to use one spacecraft than four spacecraft, so they went on to use that, and they're continuing to use that. It, uh, in other situations I've, I've seen. So that, that, that was something that actually worked. Now, how did NASA initially get wind of this? Well, I don't think it, I think it was a person at NASA who read my paper and, and contacted me and said they'd like to use this method. So I think that the paths of all these things is always rather circuitous, but the guy who is, I'm not sure how he found it. So the, the paper was kind of a diatribe about something else. There, there was a uh, something somebody had done, which I didn't, I didn't like the way they did it. And I, I, um, I actually, I, I, that paper was an interesting paper because I purposely chose the most boring sounding title for it. Um, usually, people do the opposite, but I. I, I I have my reasons. Paul, is your sense that the application of this for the MMS mission was more on a capability side or more on a basic science side? Well, I think it does both, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly basic science, but I think it improves the capability. <laughs> In what way? What does it make possible? <clears throat> well, I think they found that if they... <clears throat> um, used it on the four spacecraft and sort of averaged over this four, four spacecraft and made that like one big spacecraft, then I think they got better results than the method they were using before. It was more precise or there, there was something better uh, about it. And then it does mean that in situations where you only have one spacecraft, you could measure the wavelength of the wave, whereas otherwise you wouldn't be able to. So, so it gives you a capability. I mean, the spacecraft costs, well, MMS probably costs about a billion dollars. So one spacecraft was maybe a quarter billion dollars. So roughly speaking, it, it, this method would save you $750 million to, if you want to exaggerate or whatever, but you could use one spacecraft instead of four. <clears throat> Paul, I've asked some general questions about how you've gotten into related fields from plasma physics. What about AMO physics, atomic, molecular, and optical physics? Was was the opportunity there through the, the accretion disks in astrophysics, or was it the other way around? You were already doing AMO techniques. Well, I, 
not, I'm not sure if I would say I'm doing AMO. I mean, we, we've been doing laser-induced fluorescence, which I suppose falls under that. But I think people often lumped plasma physics into AMO, but I think that's more of an organizational thing than, than a real physics related thing um, is atomic and molecular and optical basically means it's not plasma, it's not ionized. So to the extent that I'm doing spectroscopy, uh, it would fall under that. So we, we, maybe we use things that would be listed as AMO as tools in what we're doing, but, but we're not pushing the frontiers of AMO particularly. More broadly, Paul, I'm curious, with all of the emphasis on sustainability research at Caltech, do you see a role for plasma physics? Well, fusion physics is essentially sustainability physics. I mean, that, that's how I got into the fields when I was a student. I, I was interested in that. And it's a form of nuclear power. And I mean, I can give you the spiel about fusion. I don't know. Are you familiar with the spiel about oh, fusion? Oh, it's, 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 the, it's the hope for our future. It's unlimited yeah. energy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the numbers are stupendous for it. There's, you know, there's enough fuel and seawater to power civilization forever. And a gram of fuel would power a household for a year or 10 years or something like that. I forget the numbers, but, but, but it, it, um, it would be a, certainly a panacea and it's um, has some hazards, but it's much, much less dangerous than fission physics, than, than fission reactors, because with a fission reactor, you have like five years worth of fuel sitting in the reactor all the time. And, and so if it blows up, you've got this five years worth of fuel that gets spewed across the countryside. And then you've got a lot to waste that, that is, could be turned into weapons and, and, and so on. So fusion reactors have a little bit of that. I'm not saying they have nothing, but, but they make the reactor itself radioactive, but they only have a tiny amount of fuel in the reactor at any time. You don't have five years worth of fuel and you just have that second's worth of fuel. Yeah. yeah. So it's like your car engine doesn't blow up because it doesn't have much gasoline in it at a time. Maybe the fuel tank could blow up, but the engine doesn't have much in it. Um, and it doesn't produce things that would go into atom bombs. It could if you wanted to, but it doesn't necessarily do that. So the main problem with fusion is it doesn't work. I mean, it's hard to make and probably going to be expensive, but, but if you could do it, it would be great. So that, yeah, that would be the ultimate sustainable thing. So I, I mean, I worked on it for many years, but I, I, I guess I got a little bit bored with that and, and, and moved into these other things that were related. And I, I may still occasionally do something that's related to fusion, but it's a, long thing. I was wondering specifically with regard to the Resnick Institute, if there's an opportunity there because of all of the ways they're promoting sustainability in science. Yeah, there, uh, there could be. I don't know. I have I just haven't pushed through that angle uh, too much. I, I probably could. But I, I'm very nervous about hyping things, I guess. I don't like making promises. and I, I don't like saying, oh, I'm going to develop this thing that's going to solve the world's problems and, and, and so on, because I find if you do that, you can get support right away, but then there comes a day when... What do you got? <laughs> yeah, people ask, what do you have? And, and I, I don't want to get into that situation if I don't have to. Uh, I, I'd rather stick to not, not over-promising anything and, and, and just following my nose and trying to come up with interesting things. Paul, more recently, what has been some of your work with solar coronas? Well, um, I guess what have we done lately? Well, we saw the most recent stuff we published was seeing really Taylor instability in a solar corona loop. Um, and now we're, we're looking at 
some of the twisting, the microscopic twisting that goes on. And what I'm in both the solar work and the jet work, the current emphasis is on the sequence of things that happen when one of these things goes unstable. So this is probably somewhat related to solar flares. And um, I mean, there are various pictures or analogs that I have, but you could imagine we're talking about flux tubes and the flux tube is twisted magnetic field lines and there's current flowing along. So the mental picture I have is that that's something like a rope and the rope has strands in it and, and the strands are wrapped around each other. It's braided and you might act on the sun. I think there could be a fractal arrangement where if you think of a rope that say has five braids in it, but then if you look at one of those braids, it has five smaller braids in it. And then if you look at one of those smaller braids, it has five even smaller braids and then you keep on going down and down and down. And, and, and so it, at each level it's braided, but each braid contributes to the next size braid. So we're not quite seeing that in the lab. We don't have the resolution for that. So we have sort of one set of, 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 of braids, but I think that's probably what's going on in the sun. Anyway, so, you, so imagine you have a rope and let's say you're picking up a heavy item with it. You've got a crane and it's picking up a truck or something with the rope. And, and the rope is rated at say 10,000 pounds, tensile strength. And unfortunately the truck you have is 10,001 pounds. <clears throat> so you pick it up and your rope isn't too happy. Well, the rope doesn't break all at once. Maybe one strand breaks. And if you're standing near that, you might hear a pop when it breaks. And then if it breaks, now you've got one last strand. And so you're putting more stress on the other strands because instead of sharing the, the, evenly between all, a certain number of strands, it's sharing between slightly less strands. So now there's more stress on, on the remaining strands. And so another one pops. So, so I think we're seeing stuff like that in our experiment where the equivalence of having too much weight on it is passing too much current through it. I mean, you can imagine a wire that's rated at a hundred amps and you put 500 amps through it. And maybe there's some weak spots that's like the rope breaking. So your wire could blow up there like a fuse blowing up. So we're seeing this happen in a localized place. That's it's where the weakness is. And we're, this is where we're seeing the, we're seeing a really Taylor instability that's kind of like the, the thing where the rope is starting to be stretched and getting a little bit thin. And then the snapping, uh, there are various things that maybe are equivalent to the snapping that you hear. We have waves coming off and, and we're seeing x-rays coming off and energetic particles um, coming off. You can imagine if you snap something, maybe a little piece of dust is flicked off the high speed and hits you in the cheek and you're hurt from that. So that's like a particle being energized and, and maybe hit something and makes an x-ray. So we're seeing all this stuff going on and we're trying to piece it all together and see what's leading to what and, and, and how we can explain it. And this sort of thing is going on in a solar flare. If you ask somebody what a solar flare is, they don't give you a very straight answer. They just say, well, it's sort of this and that. And it turns out that it's lots of things that, 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 that it's an explosion where many different things are happening, that there's a brightening, there, there's x-rays coming off, there's energetic particles coming off, uh, the, there's this, that, everything you can think of is basically happening. It's like you set off a bomb, what happens? Well, there's a sound wave and there's a blast wave and there's a hole in the pavements and, and a flash of light and so on. So, there are all these things happening and we're trying to piece them all together. Paul, we talked about ice grains in, in laboratory plasma, in clouds. What about interstellar ice grains? How do we know that there are ice grains in the interstellar medium? Well, people see that. There, there's actually two astrophysical places where there are, uh, there's ice and they're interrelated. So one is the interstellar medium and the other is protoplanetary disks that are the precursors of the solar system. So one is the spaces between stars and the other is like the solar pre-solar system around stars. 
<laughs> so um, I'm fairly aware of that because I'm working on things related to that now. So pe people can see that basically spectroscopically, um, the either by emission or absorption. So if I think interstellar stuff, I'm not so familiar with, but that I probably is emission, uh, could be absorption, but, but if you have um, ice, the ice is made of water molecules and the water molecules have a temperature and they means they're moving around and vibrating. And if, if they're moving around and vibrating, they will uh, emit electromagnetic radiation. Uh, um, just like, I guess, anything you, you see that's emitting light uh, shoots off photons and they, they have their characteristic photons that come off with certain wavelengths and so on. So mole molecules can emit radiation and it's done in the infrared. And so if you look through a telescope at, at the sky and then you take the light from the telescope and stick it in a spectrometer, you'll see certain wavelengths that you can identify as being water uh, or ice w w wavelengths. And they can not just see that it's water or ice, but they can see the phase of the ice. So there's interest in uh, whether ice is crystalline, that's the kind of ice that we're familiar with, or if you get a really low temperatures, the phase of ice changes and it becomes what's called amorphous ice, more like a, a glassy ice. And it can tell that spectroscopically. And then with protoplanetary disks, I think they can see emission the way I described, but more commonly they see absorption. So they'll look at a, a disk and there'll be a star, a distant star that's many light years away behind the disk. And you'll look at the light from the star coming through the disk and the disk will be more or less transparent, but it's but it's not perfectly transparent. It's a little bit opaque and it absorbs light from the star. And if there's ice in the disk, it'll uh, absorb certain wavelength of the starlight. And so you'll see a dip in the, in, in the starlight intensity at certain wavelengths. And, and you can identify that with constituents and you can also figure out that you've got ice and say something about the ice. Paul, on a personal level, when the pandemic hit and you had to shut the lab down, what projects needed to be backburnered and what could you do remotely? Well, we were building a new ice dusty plasma experiment. And I think I had spent about a year designing the thing and ordering the parts. And the parts had finally all come in and we had just started the assembly. And then the pandemic hit, and so the assembly pretty much stopped for six months. And then uh, I had a student doing that, and then he could come in a little bit, and, and he slowly put it together. So we put it together, but 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 we lost at least a year of time, I would say, in that. And then the other experiments just stopped. People couldn't go into the lab for six months, um, and. I had a new postdoc who came and he actually learned how to use the equipment uh, without anybody physically there. It was all done by cell phones and Zoom and so on. And it was, it's as if I taught you how to fly an airplane yeah. by yourself. <laughs> um, so that it certainly slowed us down. And then I tried to compensate for it by doing more theoretical design work at home. So I did write one paper at home that I probably wouldn't have written, or at least not, it wouldn't have come out so fast if I hadn't been stuck at home so, so much. This was something on ice dust. Um, it was on why ice dust is elongated. And I had, I'd had some ideas kicking around for years on that, but I decided to put some more effort into it and turned it into a, a, a real paper. And then uh, one of my students uh, had an idea. I give a talk on something that was related to accretion disks. And, and I was thinking about how something could be done. And he said he was taking a class that would maybe enable this to be done. So we worked on it. And this was all done by Zoom 
uh, and no, no in-person thing at all. It's all numerical calculation on computers. And that, that was extremely successful. We have a paper that's coming out right now on, on that. So we kept busy. Um, and Paul, just to bring our conversation right up to the present, is your lab back up to its pre-pandemic level yet? Almost. Um, people are wearing masks, but they're working there. I'm still working at home a lot. I'm not in the lab as much as I was before. I, I guess I got used to working at home. And, um, I, I personally don't push the buttons on things in the lab or tur no, turn the knobs. I let the students do that. And my job is more to suggest to them what to do or to interpret what they've done or help them when something's broken. So and so the, the, those sorts of things don't really require my physical presence so much, although it's somewhat better if I'm there. But so I've, I've been coming in more and more recently, but I'm still at home and I, I kind of set myself up to do all my uh, computer type stuff at home. So if I go back to work, then I have to, to do a big change to get back there. It's kind of, my it's kind of the new reality kind of now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know. We're, I think, I mean, if things continue to die down, I think we'll get back to normal, but, but I'm sort of afraid that things that it might, it might flare up again. And I'm not very interested in going to conferences right now. My students have been going to some, but I normally would have traveled to several conferences a year. And there, people are starting to have conferences, but I'm really not very interested in, in that at, at this point. Um, well, Paul, now that we've worked up to the present for the last part of our talk, I'd like to ask a few broadly retrospective questions about your career, and then we'll end looking to the future. So first, what what would you say if you could survey the broad contributions in plasma physics over the course of your career? What have they answered beyond the specific subfield itself? Well, I think people understand plasmas a lot better than they did when I started. Um, and you know, people, I'm operating in the areas of plasma physics that we've discussed. There are some other areas that I don't work on that we haven't touched, but that they have been influenced by the stuff that I'm working on. So there's a whole field of low energy plasma physics, which is got enormous industrial use all the chips in your cell phones you know the, you know there's a shortage of chips in the world and you can't buy a new car because they don't have chips and so on so you ask how they make the chips well they make chips using plasmas and th th there's a whole world of plasma physics there there's multi-billion dollar industry and people so, some of the stuff i do has some slight connection to, to that the dusty plasma stuff has some slight connection to that but i i, I think People understand these plasmas a lot better than they did before. I, I, I think people avoided working with those plasmas for a long time because they're very messy. They, they, they don't have the elegance of the magnetohydrodynamics. The habit's more like getting into the messy real world of stuff, not the elegant things that high flying physicists like. People have understood that a lot and you know, there's lots of money in it. So uh, I think that's progressed a lot. And then in the, in the fusion world, I think people understand the relevant plasmas quite well and the, the, they're tweaking, tweaking things now, but uh, I think that's understood quite well. And astrophysics, I think is still a bit of a frontier. I, I think there's lots that can still be done there. And Paul, for you personally, what do you see as your most significant contributions in basic science? Oh. Um, I guess the stochastic ion heating was something that I think was an important contribution over the years. That was something that started, I guess, almost 40 years ago. 
now, but that uh, I think we discussed that, but that, that showed how you could get a, a breakdown of what is normally considered uh, are invariant or constant of the motion, but you know, that could be important. And I think that that's used a lot, or at least it's understood to be an important phenomenon that can give you a, a kind of heating in certain situations. And then some of the wave stuff, I think has been important. And then I, I think we've made some impact with our jets and solar stuff that people paid some attention to that because we have, I think because of the lab experiments, we have real hands-on explanations of what's going on. I mean, it's not something I can explain in a minute. I mean, there, there are different levels of explanation. You have, the question is how long is somebody willing to listen to you? So if I could spend an hour with you on the jets and draw pictures from the wall and so on, I could, you could walk away and have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. And I don't think people had that sort of explanation before uh, in our work. I guess I, I always like to have an explanation for what's going on that you can understand in a hand-waving sort of way. And I, I think a lot of papers and so on don't have that. They're just mathematics or their observations, but there isn't this hands-on ex explanation. And I think you should be able to do that in much of plasma physics. It's a classical field. It's not like quantum mechanics where you're in introducing concepts that don't make any sense intuitively. And so this in the end should be intuitive. And so you should be able to explain it in an intuitive way. And if you can't, then there's probably something wrong. Paul, what about on the applied side? Where have you seen the most impact in applications in translating the science? The plasma physics? Well, there's plasma thrusters. Uh, people have made rocket engines that are used in spacecraft now. Um, th th they're used for making minor adjustments in spacecraft orbit or to change the direction the spacecraft is pointing. There also have been a few spacecraft where the plasma thruster has been used to propel the whole spacecraft. Um, that, that's not common, but the plasma sort of attitude correction stuff, I, th I think, is, is, com is common. So, so that's an important contribution of plasmas. As I said, the making of all the chips that we have is, is a, something where an application or a world wouldn't exist if you didn't have pl pl plasmas doing that. Um, there are odds and end type things like treating surfaces of materials with, with plasmas. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer this question so well. There are colleagues of mine who specialize in, in, in drawing long laundry lists of plasma applications and telling you how you can't move you know, for two seconds without being affected by plasma. But uh, I have to, I don't have that at the tip of my tongue, but th there are such things. Um, I, I mean, there are things where, which are really plasma and people don't think about it. So at one point I was interested in electric arc furnaces that are used in the steel industry. So when you get tired of your car and it starts leaking oil and it costs too much to repair and you, you decide to junk it, it goes to a junkyard. They don't just throw it away, but they melt it down and make steel. Are you there? I'm yep. here. Yeah. 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 They make steel and, and make a new car out of it. So how do they do that? They, they, they have a big vat that they put scrap steel in and they have an electrode uh, where they draw an arc and, and uh, heat, heat it up and, and melt it. And I used to think that this arc was melting it through the heat of the arc. But then I realized that it's actually a jet, a little bit like the jets that I have in my experiment. And when the jet hits the steel, we were talking, asking about stagnation, the jet hits the, the metal and it stops and all the kinetic energy of the jet gets turned into heat in the metal and melts the metal. So it's actually 
you know, somewhat related to, to um, our plasma jets. The parameters are a little bit similar, except our, in our experiment, we do it for microseconds where they do it steady state. So they, we have 100 million watts, but it's just for 10 microseconds where they have 100 million watts day in and day out. And, and um, I've actually, I was interested in that a long time ago and I had a patent related to that and visited a steel mill and tried, tried to get the steel companies uh, interested in a, a way of stabilizing these arcs. So, so anyways, all the steel we have, maybe not all the steel, but I think over 50% of the steel that's used in the country comes from electric arc furnaces. Uh, so that's an application of plasmas. There's not a whole lot of research going on it because it's a mature field, but um, so there, th th there are many um, various things like that where, where, where there's plasmas. There, there are people who are trying to use plasmas for medical purposes. Uh, now you can have plasma torches that will cut skin and, and do it a, in a way better than a scalpel. And there's a whole group of people doing that sort of thing and, uh, or, or they'll kill cancer cells and I mean, you name it, somebody's trying to, to, <laughs> to do something or other with it. So I have not um, really ventured into all, all these far out things, but I, I, I'm aware that you can draw a long list of them and show that plasma is somewhat ubiquitous. Finally, Maybe. Paul, looking to the future for your students as they're looking to chart their career, what's the frontier in plasma physics and how will that influence what you want to accomplish for however long you want to remain active? Well, I think the frontier now is to, in my mind, at least what we're working on, is to look at the interaction between different scales where you have different kinds of physics. There's a large scale physics and there's a lot of small scale physics and there's some kind of uh, gray area in between where the large scale is driving the small scale and the small scales driving the large scale. And that, that, this more complicated situation where you can't just write down a simple equation and say, okay, we're going to ignore the small scale and just talk about the large scale or, or vice versa. We've got to have a, it's almost like a, an electrical circuit where you've got a battery and a wire and a resistor. So if you're an old style physicist, you just worry about a wire and, and, and you just say, oh, there's a current flowing in the wire and that's it. But, but, and, and, and then another guy might just talk about resistors. Well, resistors heat up and, and doesn't know about wires. He knows, knows about resistors. And then somebody else is studying batteries and doesn't know about wires and so on. But if you wonder how does the wire affect the battery and how does the battery affect the resistor and, and so on. They're all kind of coupled together. And, and, and uh, I think that's the frontier uh, from, from my point of view, uh, because the, the, the real world, if you didn't have that, say, if you looked at the solar flares, for example, it, if you just had one model, then the thing would just sit there and it would do, the same thing over and over again. But if it blows up at a certain point, it's, it's like the story of the rope breaking. You put on too much force for the tensile strength, and then you want to study, well, why does it break? You have to start understanding tensile strength and how the molecules hold the rope together and how they detach. But, but that affects the thing breaking. And so, so you, you've got to look at multiple scales. So that, 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 Part, I think is interesting and um, we, we're doing that. Um, and then I think also there's sort of unknown unknowns as was said by Donald Rumsfeld, I guess I know, I'm not saying I'm a fan of him, but, but I think- <laughs> The phrase has stuck. stuck. <laughs> the phrase has stuck, yeah. So I think just not having a plan, but keeping your eyes open for new opportunities is very important. Yeah. Um, and trying to see things in a different way or looking for unexpected things is very important. So I, 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 I think that, that, that more progress is made that way by, by 
seizing new opportunities and exploiting them than by having some 20 step plan that you methodically follow through for you know 10 years. I, I, I don't think that works. And that's something you can always be confident of. There will always be the new opportunities. I, th I think so. I think also you have to keep your eyes on what's going on in other fields because even though you might not be so interested in other fields, there could be a technique developed in another field that you can apply to what you're doing, or there could be a, a device developed. I mean, say right now, the cameras we're using can take pictures as fast as uh, five nanoseconds per shutter speed and so on. But maybe there's some other field where somebody has come up with something that does a you know, one picosecond or, or something like that. And if you don't pay attention to what's going on there, you wouldn't know about it. But if you pay attention and you discover, hey, this exists, then you could bring it from another field and, 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 and use it. And conversely, you know, hopefully plasma physics does something once in a while that would be useful to other, other <laughs> fields too. Um, but uh, so, so we're, um, yeah, it, I think one of the things I'm doing is continually bringing in technologies from other fields to, 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 to diagnose our plasma. So we, uh, when I started, I didn't know much about spectroscopy or about x-rays or about mass spectroscopy and so on, and, and, or uh, high-speed electronics, and we had to learn all these things and bring them in. And so I think there continually will be new things that one can learn and bring in. Paul, it's been a great pleasure spending this time with you. I'm so happy we were able to capture all of your perspectives and insights. I'd like to thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Well, thank you very much.